today's discussion. So we're going to enter into chapter five. So chapter five, we're going to start uh, really dig into the uh, analysis of circuit, uh, especially amplified circuit. So we're going to uh, move away from the understanding of uh, bipolar junction, the physics of bipolar junction transistor, uh, through the understanding of uh, basic device model, device equations, uh, current voltage equations, and small signal models. We're going to enter into analysis of how do you, based on this understanding of model of transistors, how do we actually use these transistors and construct circuit architectures? So, in chapter five, we're going to touch basically. Um, I'm going to start with general consideration in terms of understanding what is the basics of a uh, amplifier. How does one consider what are the key factors you wish to evaluate or you wish to analyze in uh, understanding an amplifier circuit? So we're going to talk about uh, general consideration of amplifying circuits. And the next thing is, of course, uh, as I said, any, if you're dealing with analog signals, what happened is that you wanted to, uh, these signals are typically small. Therefore, uh, these are a small signal. You start at a particular point. So biasing point is a very important thing. So as I said, once, uh, when we want to start with generating a small signal model, you start with understanding where your standing, where, where your standing point is. That's called the operating point. So uh, some of the example is that uh, you typically have, an, I, the operating point is given to you. For example, I'm telling you the biasing current of the circuit is at a particular point. But uh, in a lot of the design, one of the key challenge for designer is to place your circuit at this particular operating point. That's called the biasing design or biasing circuits. So how does one make sure that my, as I said, I use this uh, analogy that it's like uh, if I'm a performer and I wanted to stand at the spotlight, how, how does one make sure that every time I will be able to stand at this particular point, stable and reliable. So that's called biasing design. What, what type of design to ensure your, your performance right at this particular point? That's called biasing design. So we're going to talk about various ways of doing that and what are the trade-offs. So as I said, uh, design, what we, uh, I, I will talk about what are the performance or figure merits, but one of the key important thing is stability, meaning that every time, if you are performing 10 times in a stage, you want to make sure that 10 times you're sitting, you're right at the spotlight, uh, does not miss any time. That's called the st stability or robustness. We're going to talk about that when we talk about bias in design, of course. And then um, after setting our, and after um, providing the particular schemes that we can use to setting your circuit at a particular point, we're going to talk about, of, of course, amplifier topology, various ways of constructing the amplifier. These are the three important ways. One is called these, C stands for comma. So CE is comma what? Comma what? You have only three terminals, so comma emitter. Yes, this is comma emitter. So by the same method, this is um, by the same, this is common base and common collector. Okay, so common typically, common typically means that those are the referencing points. So if you look at the circuit architecture on the right, if I'm setting it to ground, it's typically a common to AC signal or DC biasing. So these are DC biasing. So if I'm, I'm setting my emitter to ground, this is a very typical common emitter architecture. If I'm setting my base to a DC level, the rest, the, the two terminal which lef, left uh, on common, I should say, will then be left as the input and output. So you can see that input at, so for common, it's a big one. I think it's a hornet. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh. 
I'm afraid of the hornet. Anyway, that's your, let's make sure. See, this door is open. Open it. Let's go out. Don't 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 hit him. Don't hit him. It's gonna it's gonna. Wait, wait, wait. He's gonna get bit. He's gonna get bit. He's a good bird. I'm gonna skip. Okay. Okay, never mind. I don't. Okay, anyway. So, you sure you want to take this class? Okay. So, um, anyway, we'll go back to our architecture. One of the key points is that uh, the common node is a reference node. And then you have two input and output. There's, in an amplifier, you definitely have an input and output. Therefore, the input will then be mostly at base. That's comma emitter. And then your output collector is the typical output. So that's what we call the comma emitter architecture. And then you have this comma base. You can have the base as the reference node. And we have input coming in from emitter, output, and collector. And of course, the last one is that we could have our collector being at a DC level, a bias at DC level, and then your input is coming in from, collect, uh, from base and then going out at the emitter. That's called the common collector, OK? So these are the structures that we're basically going to follow. And we're going to talk about what are, the, what are the features. They have different features. These are, um, why are we using these co combination of architectures to construct a favorable performance? for the amplifier. So typically in a, for example, the, um, if you remember in our first class, I introduced a classic design, right? The classic operational amplifier. It has all these three components. You want to use these components in order to construct a, uh, uh, to meet the various requirements at each stage. And at each, so you have multiple stages to construct a perfect uh, or more ideal characteristic of your amplifying circuit. So before we actually move into the details, so uh, we're basically going to start talking about what is an analog circuit. Typ a typical analog circuit is typically a circuit which processes signals, analog signals. So when you process the signal, these signals are typically, in most cases, are voltages. You transform it into voltage at the very beginning. For example, if I'm sensing my signal, as I use the example of a, a pistol circuit, for example, your, your, for your sim, uh, image sensor, you have pistol circuit. You convert the signal, the light signal, into voltage at the very beginning. And then you transduce into process, processing sta stages and then transform into output. So what we're, what we're actually doing in most of the analog circuit is to process these voltage, voltage signals. So these are the main part. Of course, you can deal with current signals, but that's uh, fairly rare. So mostly, we're dealing with voltage signals. So we're going to talk about mostly our voltage amplifier, meaning that there's various type of amplifier. If you Take circuit theory, what are the other types? There's voltage amplifier, you can do current amplifier, you can have trans, trans, um, transconductance amplifiers or resistance amplifiers, depending on your input and output signal. But if my input and output signal are both voltages, and that would be a best uh, solution with then, uh, to use a voltage amplifier. So in a voltage amplifier, what are the, uh, one of the key things people look for are the performance factors. So if I give you a voltage, voltage amplifier, how does one evaluate whether this is a good voltage amplifier or a bad voltage amplifier? How, do, how does one evaluate? So there are, we call the performance factors. What are the key performance factors a designer or a user will look for? So uh, typically what you refer to, or in a lot of the circuit, if you ever go into circuit design studies, you look at the paper, they have the figure mirrored uh, tables. So those are, uh, you can either refer to that as a figure mirrored in a circuit evaluation. So performance factors uh, some, sometimes referred to as figure mirrors. So what are the key figure mirrors? What are the things they're looking for in evaluating a circuit, whether it's good or bad? 
One of the key important thing is because it's a voltage amplifier, of course, you look for amplification, the gain. How much um, does it provide, uh, the, the gain of this amplifier? Next thing, of course, is speed. You want to make sure that it follows when I, uh, when I apply a certain uh, amount of signals. But this part, we're not going to talk about until, I think, chapter 11, when we talk about frequency response. So when we refer to this will be address when we talk about frequency response. So how wide can this circuit be? OK? And then the next thing is, of course, the power. How much, what is your cost in um, operating the circuit? That's the power. In this circuit, it will depend on, in most of the analog circuit, for digital circuit, there's what we call the transition uh, or transient power. But in, in analog circuit, mostly there's a DC power. So DC power is power, this is uh, dissipation, DIS. Power, uh, power dissipated power is the uh, current that is being biasing the circuit and VCC. So this will depend a lot on how the biasing circuit is designed. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. It will be related to the biasing design. So how much does it put in in order for your circuit to be stay at this particular state, waiting for the signal to come in? That's called a DC power or, this, uh, or uh, biasing power. Typically, biasing power will determine most of the power in an analog circuit. And of course, lastly, we'll talk about whether it's a no, um, low noise design or whether it's being disturbed by uh, noise signal. So this part, we're going to, a little bit, there, there, of course, if you um, go into analog circuit design, there's a lot of factors that allow us to design or analyze, such as uh, numbers like noise figures or detailed noise analysis. But in this case, we're simply going to talk about, in this class, we're simply going to address some methods in reducing the noise in the system, uh, especially in differential pair. This is also in, I think, in chapter 12, or I don't know, maybe uh, later in the discussion. OK? So any questions on this part? It's not leaving. I don't want to go. <laughs> OK, so what we're going to do is I'm going to jump over to that, that form. This, is, this, is look, this looks alive. So what we're going to do is um, talk about, okay, as I said, aside from having a GAN, how does one evaluate whether a voltage amplifier is a good amplifier? So one of the key important things is, um, other than this voltage gain, you wanted to make sure that your amplifier actually deal with uh, interface with signal very well. That's, that's when we introduce something called, the, uh, you see the, you see the, uh, <laughs> the green part, where there's input impedance and alpha Z in, Z out. So we're going to talk about impedance. Impedance is the, I'm just going to give you the, the definition, the ratio of a voltage phaser to current phaser. So this is, uh, in circuit theory, already deal with that. So I'm just going to define it. So by definition, the impedance will be V as a function of frequency, current as a function of frequency. So this, this will be your impedance. There will be the real part and imaginary part. Typically, the real part will be the resistive part. And the uh, X part, the imaginary part, is typically capacitance or inductance. But in this case, in our, um, the circuit that we're going to discuss is mostly a uh, capacitive uh, component. So this is resistive component introduced by the resistive. And this is capacitive. If we're, if we're staying in relatively low frequency uh, domain. So um, 
in, in, in analyze and amplify it aside from just the pure uh, uh, voltage gain, for example, we also want to look at its interfacing capability, which will then be referred to how does one characterize how well it interacts with signals, input and output signals. Then that's the interfacing point. So the interfacing will then be determined by two of the main characteristics, which is input and output impedance. So the input will de determine these, these will determine the how well does it transfer transfer of signals between stages. So the point is that um, I want to, aside from just the main building, I have to interface with previous or next stage. So these stages will then limit uh, the, the interface quality or the input and output impedance will then affect how well does the, the voltage amplifier taking the signal without degrading and add right at the interface. So how does one build this interface is very important in this design as well. So that we're going to look at, so think about a voltage amplifier. Let me use a voltage amplifier example. What do you want? So let's say if I have a voltage amplifier, for a voltage amplifier, what we typically do is, let's say, VCC ground. If I'm only looking at the small signal, I could actually construct a two-port model, which describe how it, I will wrap it with a black box. And only looking at these lines, the characteristic of input and output, the corresponding characteristic, and using an equivalent two-port model to describe this. So for a voltage amplifier, we know that it will then have a input impedance. And then, because it's a voltage amplifier, so we, I'm using a voltage control voltage source. And then, output is the output. So a general, this is a general, we call it a two-pore model. Two-pore model of a voltage amplifier to describe how, do you, how does this input and output signal voltage amp. Okay? So this is equivalent to this equivalent uh, two-pore model. And let me finish this description. So I have a voltage gain. That's the key voltage AV. I'm, I'm just going to talk about that a little bit. So this voltage control voltage source depends on its input voltage here. V is in V1. OK? So if this is the case, this is my, this is my, This is my voltage control voltage is the same thing. So if this is my voltage control voltage source, what, are, what do I look for? What, what do I look for in input and output impedance? Does anyone know? What do I want? For an ideal, does anyone know if it's an ideal? For an ideal. For an ideal voltage source, a voltage amplifier should say. What do I look for in input, output, and of course, ideally, you want to have infinite as as high as possible. You want uh, we call these are the three important parameters. Let me write it down. So three important parameters, V in is the input impedance. V out is the output impedance. 
And of course, AVO is typically referred to as the open circuit. The O stands for open circuit voltage gain. This is when you're not connecting to a load. That's how, what, what is the amount of voltage gain when this is open, open circuit. OK? So let's give, a, give you a general problem. So if this is my amplifier, when you use it, you typically connect it to a source signal coming from a transducer, a sensor, for example. So whatever you have at the beginning at here, at the source side, it will look something more like this. Um, so in general, I have all kinds of sources, uh, input sources. So input sources, a typical model for your input signal source will be something more like this. If it's a voltage source, it will look something more like this. Okay? And at my output terminal, once your amplifier is being done, the, for example, if my signal is already being amplified through this wireless sy system transmitted into the speaker, I need to drive the speaker. So the speaker has a, we call the loading resistance. So your output typically is referred to, the output terminal is typically referred to as a loading resistor. So, so you can model it as a load. So our load is called a loading resistor. Uh, Let me write it down here. So there's, there's two things depending on your signal, where your signal coming in, and this is where the output is being delivered out. So this is called a loading resistance resistor. And then RS is the source resistor. So these are typical models for your input and output. You need to take in the signal. And then this, this may be my microphone. Microphone can be modeled as a part that taking the signal, and then there may be a, a par parasitic source resistance, par parasitic um, series resistance. And here is the loading resistance. So if I look at my final output, if I actually construct this circuit, this is my V out. So I want to know the overall V out versus V in. V out versus V. S, that's my source signal, will then become RS plus R and I'm using the So if you construct the output and input relationship, it will be something like this, R load. Okay, so this is your final relationship between output and input sources, right? If this is the case, if, you, if, if I want to get the most obtainable results, maximum gain, which is AVO, how do I get this? I want to make, how do I approach more ideal results? I want input resistance to be what? What do I want? I want it larger or small? Just give me direction. Input resistance large. I want it large so I don't see this, right? So if V in approaches infinite, this term will then approach one. You want it to approach one. And then I want output resistance. This is what I can control. Remember RS and R load is your customer. You cannot control it. It's your input. It's whatever you want any customer to be, to be satisfied, right? So loading is your customer. Sources is whatever you need to fit in. You need to fit to your customer. Your designer, you can only manipulate these two. These are the external environment. You want to make sure that your circuit is robust. In any type of environment, it should deliver AVO. If you can design that, that will be perfect. It will be independent of what kind of sources you're dealing with or what kind of loading you're dealing with. So for an ideal voltage amplifier or 
for example, operationally amplify its target is to have input impedance approaching infinite. And I want my output impedance, sorry, I made a mistake. I want my Z also. We go to Let me change the color. So this is the one that I can control. The white one are the ones that's within my design. And the rest is the environment. You want to make sure that at whatever environment, you will be able to get the maximum performance, right? So the yellow one is external. These are internal. Internal is what you can design. You want to design and amplify which fit all con condition, right? So then, I want, what do I want for ZL? Yes, a small pulse, I want to approach zero for ideal. Right? So remember this, this is what we're going to look for if we're dealing with a voltage amplifier. So how does one make sure that your this input impedance as high as possible output. Uh, it's gone. Yes. OK. <laughs> I can move to the standard. Finally. OK, so then uh, we have a basic understanding as to what is needed for a voltage amplifier. The next thing is then, how does one determine its it's impedance in a circuit. So these are all small signal models. So these are, we want to find the small signal. So how does one find the small signal impedance in a circuit? If I give you an arbitrary circuit, arbitrary amplify, how does one find these impedance? So the idea is, first of all, for a circuit, whatever model you have, you want to make sure that if this is my circuit, that I'm looking into the input terminal. Um, since we're not actually dealing with capacitive component, I'm going to limit this discussion to input, um, input resistance for this class, for, for at least for this chapter. We're going to limit ourselves on only talking about resistance because capacitive components are not yet being considered. So what we're going to do is to find or R in, R out. So how do we find the input and output resistance? The way to do this is that I'm setting and make sure that my output is open. I'm opening my output. And then uh, what is typically being done is that if I don't know what my um, input resistance is, typically what one can do is to give a test voltage and look at its test curve. I'm going to use this scheme a lot in, in our future analysis. For example, if you have a common emitter circuit, you want to look at what your input resistance is. Then we're going to construct our small signal model and then do this. So the input resistance will be defined R in. The resistance looking in R in is by definition Vx. It's the relationship between my test voltage and test current. This is also true if you have a real circuit. If you have a real circuit, what you do is that you open the output and then look into the voltage and current relationship when you're looking into the input terminal. So that's how one gets its input. So in this analysis, you want to set all. Uh, first, you set all in independent sources. To ground to zero. That means open V to zero, which means it's open. I to uh, I to zero, 
I to zero means open, V to zero means short. So you short all, let me highlight, independent. If there's any independent sources inside this circuit, you set it to zero. And before we find in these input and output resistance. Well, those, those are a lot of examples. And then for output terminal, if you're looking at the output terminal, the same thing, you give a test voltage, Vx, and look at its test current. But in this case, we want to set our sources to zero. So you short input. So in this case, short input. That means that you set your uh, independent sources to the Vs. We set our independent sources to zero and look at what is the corresponding or equivalent voltage and current relationship. So that would then give us R out. So the R out will be defined as Vx, Ix as well, during this test condition. So you test the front to get the input resistance, test the back for the output resistance. Once you have this, then we can construct our overall, overall small signal model, two-pole model. You have the input resistance, the output resistance voltage gain. So in the following discussion, most of the questions we're going to ask you is that once you design your amplifier, these are the three key parameters you need to deliver for, an, for a voltage amplifier. At least in chapter, in chapter five, you need to deliver three key parameters, AVO, how much voltage can, input, output. So that will give us how well it amplifies the signal and how well it interacts with input and output terminals, input and output signals. So this is for interfacing, and this is internally how well does Amplify deliver its amplification factor. OK? So once we have this, then any of the circuit, whatever it is, for example, if I have a, if I have a common emitter amplifier, for example, looking like this, I'm just giving a very rough. Uh, I can wrap it up and then say that it's equivalent to R in So what we're going to do in this class is that I'm going to give you various type of architecture and various type of uh, uh, circuit architecture or uh, modification of, for example, comma emitter stages. Then you have to turn it into this tuple model, finding out these three key parameters. Once this has been constructed, then we can actually put it into a stage of your amplifier and then interact with other stages and then construct a larger block or larger circuit um, architecture. Okay, so you have the unit block. This is the same thing. You built a equivalent model. Once this is being done, you can then use this model to interact with various stages. So this is a next level of abstraction is that you build this model and then this can be used when we have multiple stages in your amplifier. So what we're going to do for this lecture, or at least for this week, is from this to this. How does one translate these two? And how does one finding this input and output resistance behavior? And of course, voltage here. OK, good. So that's the main target of this. Um, circuit. So um, 
Before we actually actually go into these various architecture, for example, the comma emitter, we're going to start with comma emitter and comma base and comma collector, of course. But before we actually go into these different stages, introducing different stages, we want to talk about the next important thing is called setting up your amplifier to the correct position, which is called setting the oper operating Before you can um, start you know, watching or see the performance of the singer, you want to make sure that your singer is standing at the spotlight, as I said. So how does one determine its operating point is by, as, as we already know, you do some large signal analysis. So what is typically being done is that before I decide where I want it to stand, the first thing we do is to sur survey the whole, whole stage. So for example, I'm just going to give a very rough analysis. So before you come into the stage, I want to see where, where should I stand to get the best performance. That's called selecting the operating point. So selecting, how does one select an operating form? So typically being done is that you want to construct something called a transfer function. So this will be then be my V in. This will be a large signal range, V in and V out. So you do a survey across the whole stage. I start from this end. For example, I start from 0 to VCC mostly. So this will be my VIN. So this will be fairly simple. What would typically be done is that I, if I want to measure it, simply I'm ramping this. I'm just going to give it a ramp of voltage and then look at what is corresponding voltage in volt to measure the output voltage, the corresponding output signal. So what do you think it will look like? Does anyone want to try? So if I'm starting at zero, where do you think, anytime when you do this type of, we're not going to do, we're not gonna do a detail, I'm just going to give you a rough, a rough, uh, a rough uh, transfer function dis description. So when you do this type of transfer function analysis, one of the key things is that you find points. You find key points. Or, uh, For example, you look at zero. What do you expect this device will be? The output. When this is zero, your output will be what? What do you think? Anyone want to guess? What do you think your output will be? At zero, just to zero. So this is VL. Transfer function is V in, V out, right? So where do you think your V out at zero will be? Hmm? V, v what? V B E. Oh yeah, I can give you a V B E. I can you uh, for this transistor. I'm gonna give you a parameter because we can give it the parameters. So let's say this is Q1, and it has, for example, Q1 has a V B E on of 0.8. And then you have a beta of like 100. So just a rough parameter, right? So what do you think it will look like for this point? At zero, this transistor will be on or will be off, right? So it will stay off before 0.8. So you're expecting the collector current because Q1 is off. So at this, be between 0 to 0.8, Q1 is off, meaning that IC equals to what? You already forgot? Equals to 0. Yes, correct. Therefore, my output, let me write down. Yes, correct. My output by DC is VCC, IC, RC. 
So since I see zero, I should have a zero. I should have, I should stay at, um, let me use a different color. So in between, because this transistor is off, so Q1 is off, I should stay at VCC. Right? Once it turns on, because this is a exponential model, so it doesn't really matter. You would then have a drastic drop. I'm not going to go into the, how much gain there is. But basically, roughly, if you look at this, the, the, the tr transfer characteristic, it will be something, something like this. It will be very quickly because uh, it's an exponential voltage. So you would then have a very small range of increase of voltage. If you use a constant voltage model, it will be a straight line. But in real case, it will be somewhat very high gain because exponential dependency. Therefore, you see a significant drop, and then it will stop at where? Where do you think the third turning point will be? So at this range, at this very sharp turn, I have three ranges. I have, as I said, in this part, this is one, and then I have two. Region two. This is when you have a sharp transition. This is when transistors are on. This is on. The voltage is high, so that Q one is in active, right? Because my collector voltage is high. But once it drop until where? Until very low. So until when? Until. What is the turning point? What do you think this turning point be? About, so I forgot to give another parameter. So VCE set using VCE point 0.4 volt. So meaning that if it drop until VCE set, this is point 0.4, this is VCE set. When it drop to lower than VCE set, it would then enter saturation. And then the, the collector current will then does not correspond to VBE that much. So we'll then flatten out. So there's basically three regions. One, when it's off. Two, when it's inactive. And then three, when it's saturation. Q1. OK, so. One of the key important things in large signal analysis is that first you survey the whole stage and look for where, you, where do you want your operating point B, one, two, or three? Which region? Where, where do you want? Two, of course. We wanted to make sure that our amplifier, our, our transistor is in active mode in order for the amplification or trans transconductance will be active, the small signal model will be valid when it's only in two. And where do you think I should pick? There's a various region for two. Where do you think I should stand? Middle. Yes, at the middle, that's correct. So in most cases, in most of the design, you want to make sure that you're, if I already draw this plot, then I would decide that I should stand, let me get over. So I find this is the maximum. This is typically V out max. Right? This is V out minimum. If I'm considering region two. So typically what I want to do is to place operating point at the center. Max plus VL. The reason why typically what we want to do, it's not necessarily every time, but in typical design, you want to stand in the center because I don't want to fall. Because you want to make sure that when you have a signal, you will then allow the maximum swing. We call the maximum swing. It will allow you to dance. This is your output. That's your maximum swing. You want to make sure that you have the maximum swing. If you place it in the middle, then I should then have a maximum uh, margins for me to dance. Otherwise, I will be limited. If I stand right at the stage, 
at this end will probably fall down the stage. That means there will be distortion on your signal. So in typical cases, you want to stand in the Before I start going through various biasing design, I'm just going to tell you that uh, in an integrated circuit, uh, we're gonna, none of this will be used <laughs> if you're using integrated circuit. So the real biasing scheme is if you're using integrated uh, architecture, is typically uh, will be introduced. Uh, yes, is it? Uh, what we're gonna do? Yes. Thank you. So, so there. So what we're gonna do uh, next is just to discuss how do you set. Uh, the biasing to place your circuit at a particular operating point through what we call a biasing circuit. So these are more, most, li most likely like uh, if you're doing discrete circuit design. If you're doing integrated circuit design, one of the most important solution is the architecture we're not going to talk yet. So, so this is mo mostly for discrete uh, circuits, meaning that if you buy a transistors and you go get these resistors component. But in most integrated circuit, I want to emphasize again, you don't actually have too much room for placing resistors. Resistors are very costly and unreliable component. So typically in, in real circuits, you don't actually use these schemes. But we're gonna talk, still going to talk about the schemes. So for you to get an understanding as to what are the key points people are, look, look, people are looking for in the biasing design.